guys uh paul from southern maryland divers glad you joined us today for our facebook live um, we have today we're going to be talking about underwater photography and just some basics uh as far as underwater photography goes this is not a very thorough um it's not a class to teach you how to do everything with underwater photography more just a overview of underwater photography along with some options you have as far as different pieces of equipment for underwater photography and um, <clears throat> other options. So just trying to make every sure everything here is working. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. I'm trying to see if it is showing as streaming. Let me see here. So as far as I can see, I should be streaming. Has anybody joined? I don't see anybody joining on here yet. But um, anyway, so we're going to get right into it as far as uh, underwater photography goes. So I have a little bit of a PowerPoint. It is uh, a bunch of slides. We're probably gonna fly through them pretty quick just because uh, I don't want this to be a three hour presentation. Um, this is actually the same PowerPoint that I do for photography clubs that request me to come in and talk about it as well as um, occasionally for like the dive club or whatever, but we'll expand more on those presentations when I do it in person just cause it's easier to do. So um, anyway, we'll get back, we'll get right to it. Um, so here's, uh, I'm going to talk about me for a little bit and why I can talk about this. So I've been diving for 15 years now. I have over a thousand dives, uh, started with a simple point and shoot camera, very cheap point and shoot camera. And then, um, over the years I evolved over to a very large and expensive setup, um, which includes a Canon 5 DSR and Ike light housing with two strobes on it. And believe it or not, even though I have that nice, big, expensive setup, uh, and it does amazing, I've actually kind of backed down a little bit from that to starting to use my GoPro a little bit more. And I'll go over why I, uh, I've kind of gone that route here recently. Um, so equipment options, we have a couple different ones. You have compact point and shoot cameras. Uh, we can group like the GoPro into that. We can group, uh, there's some really cheap uh, knockoffs of GoPros that you can count into that um, section. DSLRs, digital SLRs, you can maybe even find an original film SLR somewhere. Um, that would be a larger camera that's meant or produced generally for topside photography, but uh, then you put an underwater housing on it and you can use it underwater. Underwater ready camera systems such as the Sea Life camera systems. We carry those in the shop. Those cameras are made and designed to be used underwater. And so uh, there are advantages to those, um, but when you start doing topside photography outside of the water, then you get some of the drawbacks of it being designed mainly around underwater um, cameras. So trying to see here, does anybody watching can you post something in the comments that you can see and hear me just to make sure that everything's working here because I'm not seeing just want to make sure everybody can see what's going on here let me see here I'm gonna try to pull it up on my phone real quick uh, Okay, good. All right, so everybody can hear and see. Good. Okay, I just got some feedback. Thank you, Andrew. I appreciate it, and Dave. Um, so anyway, we're going to go back to the feed is not feeding back to me the way it's supposed to. But anyway, so everybody can hear me. Um, and then the GoPro stuff, I kind of lumped that in under the compact point and shoot because it is a compact point and shoot. But um, some of the features that GoPro has recently released have really opened up um, the feasibility of using a GoPro and getting some really quality stuff out of it. Uh, underwater and I'm going to go over that here in a little bit. So compact camera systems, the advantages obviously a smaller size for travel so I can throw my entire GoPro um, setup with lights in a small Pelican case or even in a carry-on bag and then uh, take it with me whereas my large um, my large camera system, my DSLR, I can fit it just barely into a carry-on size uh, package and that's 
the only thing I could fit in there. So I wouldn't be able to put any um, dive computers or regulators or anything else in that package. Literally that, that box, that Pelican box that I take is just on the outside size of uh, being able to take as a carry on. It's very heavy and there's nothing else that fits in there. It's just the camera equipment. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The ability to change lenses underwater, you have that with the compact uh, system. So if you're wanting to shoot uh, macro for half a dive, wide angle on half a dive, you can do that by just changing a lens underwater. Whereas with a larger DSLR, you cannot do that. Uh, you have to change the port out in between dives and uh, you cannot do that. You would not want to do that on the boat. You would want to do that, like pick a day for wide angle, pick a day for macro, and then just stick to that stuff that day. So the compact stuff lets you do that underwater, which is nice. Um, the ability to, I'm sorry, the less drag underwater, so the small ones, very small, compact. You're not carrying around this big honking huge camera system with you. And so it makes it a little bit easier to get around underwater on and off the boat, that kind of thing. Um, and the weight, obviously, is another one that you have to keep in mind. So um, thing disadvantages of compact or smaller camera systems are a smaller sensor. And so... The smaller the sensor, the less light it can detect uh, to take your image. And then uh, what happens then is that you get either a dark image or the shutter has to be such a slow speed that you end up getting movement in your picture. So if you have a very large sensor, it's able to uh, see more light. You can speed up the shutter uh, speed faster and you're not going to have any of that movement that you would in a, a smaller sensor. An increased, uh, we just talked about the increased shutter delay. Um, well, actually not really. So the shutter delay is basically from the time you push the button to capture the image to when it actually shuts to, hits the shutter and opens the shutter up uh, to gather the light for the pic picture. With the smaller compact ones, because they're software, mostly software driven and not physical driven, um, they and, and just to keep the cost down, um, usually you're not going to have a very quick uh, shutter release. So you'll push the button and it'll be like, you know, a quarter of a second and it'll fire versus the larger cameras. You can fire as soon as you hit that button, man, it's open in the shutter and you've got your image. So um, if fleeting moments, obviously, if you're trying to get something quick on a compact is not necessarily um, too good of an option. You can GoPro has an option where you can push and hold the shutter and it'll take a bunch of images all at once. And then you can go in and grab the one that you like the best. But again, we're going to go back to the smaller sensor doesn't gather as much light. And so it ends up trying to stay open longer to gather the light it needs. And then you end up with some blur in your images. Um, less choices for good quality lenses because the camera comes the way it is. Even the wet lenses that you can change underwater, you're not getting really good um, lens optics on it. So on the big DSLR cameras, you're talking about, you know, four, five, six, even a couple thousand dollars sometimes just for a lens. And that's because it is uh, finely machined to get the absolute best image you can versus these guys are kind of just made into the camera. And um, you're not going to get the quality there that you would on a bigger system. Uh, only a couple models can shoot in RAW and use a true fisheye lens. That is uh, that is true to a point. They're getting much better with that. So even like the GoPro now can shoot in RAW mode. Just keep in mind that the smaller cameras, they don't have the um, technology inside to be able to shoot RAW fast. And so that's another advantage of a DSLR over a compact camera is that when you're shooting raw, it's a very large image file. And to be able to write that to the SD card and then go on to the next image within a, you know, a very small short time is reduced on these smaller cameras just because the technology is not in there, it's not put into it because it would just be too expensive. You would get small cameras that would cost a billion dollars. So um, that's another reason that a compact would have a disadvantage over a large DSLR. I just talked about the raw, raw write speeds. Uh, less battery life, these things, uh, the, the GoPros and stuff, you're not going to get the battery life out of them that you would for a DSLR camera. Um, especially um, using them in video mode, they really eat the battery up pretty good. So uh, less control over depth of field, that's true. So depth of field is basically if you see an image where the main part of the image that the photographer wants you to see is in is in crisp, clear detail, and then the background is blurred. That's what we call depth of field. And so to be able to do that with a smaller compact camera is really difficult to do because they're generally set to do a large depth of field. 
um, meaning that the foreground and the background is going to be clear in the entire picture. And so being able to separate that on a small camera is really difficult. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, DSLR advantages. So um, there's a couple of brands up there that are, that's not all inclusive by any means. The ability to shoot in RAW almost, I, I don't even know of a DSLR that can not shoot in RAW mode. And what RAW means is that it's gathering a ton of information. There's no compression made in the image. The camera's gathering everything the sensor sees, literally everything the sensor sees, and putting it into a file. And where that really benefits you is later on in post-editing, where you can go in and really fine-tune the image how you want it to, based on colors, exposure, all kinds of different things that you can adjust by having the full RAW image. The raw images are very large in size, and that means that when you're shooting a burst, that um, you're not going to be able to shoot continuously in raw, just because the, the file sizes, I mean, they're 20, 30, 40 megabytes per image, and um, you just can't, it's not an instant write. It's, there's a buffer in there, and there's some mechanics that have to happen in the background for that to work. So, um, But the DSLRs do, you will get 20 or 30 shot bursts out of most of your DSLRs before it has to stop and buffer for a second and then you can continue shooting. Uh, aperture settings, shutter speed settings, and depth of field, those are all adjustable on a DSLR. Um, and so you can change how you want the image to look and capture how you want it to look underwater versus to having to go through and actually do post editing for all those changes, which is really nice. Some of the disadvantages of a big DSLR system uh, they're difficult to access the camera features. So the housings that are made for these, they have buttons for each one of the um, adjustment features. And they're not necessarily um, easy to manipulate all the time. So if, uh, I don't actually have mine out to be able to show you guys. But um, if you come to the, if we have the club meeting, hopefully we will where I do it, I'll have it out so you can see it. But the, the buttons are kind of, um, they're difficult to manipulate when you're underwater. Um, Difficult to remember which button performs which function. That is, if you're using your DSLR a lot on the surface and you're using a lot of those features on the surface, you should know what each button does um, and be almost muscle memory to where you can get to it quickly. But then, like the bullet above that says, is that you are now adjusting different buttons on the housing even though they they access the button that you're trying to get it's in a different position so the muscle memory kind of gets lost a little bit unless you're doing a ton of shooting underwater and i mean a lot um, just about every vacation i take where i'm shooting with my big dslr i take two or three days to get back up to speed with everything before i start really getting some good images so it does take a lot of a lot of shooting to be able to be really proficient with them Two-handed operation is needed for accessing most of the camera features. You can't just, like a small GoPro, you can hold it with one hand and shoot. Well, this these guys, they're large, so you got to really have two hands on it to be able to access the features and do what you want. Uh, with the housing and lighting setup, uh, it's very bulky. Edge dragging can be difficult to capture fleeting moments. The reason for the fleeting moments thing is because you're having to move that entire camera rig underwater quick. So if you're swimming along and you're shooting... Uh, a reef scene and then a manta ray goes to your right to get over to it if it's going fast you have to move that whole camera system over there and it's large it's bulky so not impossible and certainly happens all the time but it definitely makes it more difficult um, some features for underwater cameras full manual mode is available with your dslrs even the gopros are starting to get into uh, having access to the manual mode uh, which lets you adjust all those features we talked about earlier, like aperture, shutter speed, and um, the, the uh, ISOs, stuff like that. Close macro mode. Uh, if you're using the wet lenses, you would want to use the lens versus actually doing the in-camera macro mode. In-camera macro mode is going to use a digital uh, zoom, basically, and you always reduce the quality of the images when you use anything digital. Ability to uh, take wet lenses, macro, we talked about that. Uh, the fisheye lens is probably one of the most beneficial options of having of using a, a DSLR, and that's because uh, water gets or I'm sorry, light gets filtered by water, and that's not just from the sunlight to the bottom. So when you took your underwater um, your scuba class, you learned that as you go deeper, the light gets filtered by different wavelengths. And that's not just from top to bottom, that's also um, horizontal underwater. So if you're in front of, let's say, a prop of a wreck 
and you're six feet away and you have to get six feet away to fill the lens or fill the image with the prop because your camera doesn't really have a good fisheye on it, even having a huge strobes or a huge light on it, that light's not going to penetrate generally six feet through the water and be able to give you the light you need to get a good image. So what a fisheye does is you can get really, really close, like two or three feet from that, um, from that prop and still be able to see the full prop in the, in the lens because it's a fisheye lens. It has a very wide uh, angle. And then the light will be able to penetrate through two or three feet of water much better than it would six feet of water. So you're going to get a better image. You'll still be able to get the entire uh, prop in there, and but with the better light. And then the DSLRs have the low shutter lag, which we talked about. When you shutter lag is basically after you push the button to take the pictures, how long it takes before it actually takes the picture. Longer battery life, because you're not using a ton of stuff except for recording the images, um, there's not a lot of software stuff in there. Uh, in these DSLRs, you're going to have a much longer battery life. The ability to view the histogram after the image is taken, and a histogram is basically, um, here I'll switch over to a different screen here. The histogram is this right up here, and that shows you uh, the balance of the different colors, and it's way outside of what we're going to talk about here, but you can really fine tune how your image is going to look by having a really decent balance of those up there. Um, manual white balance is another one that's really good. So if you're shooting underwater and you want the images to come out with more lifelike colors, because we talked about how reds, reds specifically, as you go deeper, get filtered from uh, the image. They get filtered from your vision too, to where our eyes adjust sometimes to where we don't even notice it, but the camera's going to capture what it actually sees. So with the, the red wavelength uh, being filtered out at depth, if you can tell the camera, hey, this is what white's supposed to look like, it's going to then it capture the image with the reds in it. Um, so there's a lot more technicality to that, but it's outside of what we're going to talk about today. But I'll, I'll show you in a minute how we can do that post as well. But being able to do it on the fly is going to give you a better image. Now, the absolute best, the best uh, scenario for capturing good color underwater is to bring light with you. But if you don't have light with you, or if you haven't bought your strobes yet, then you can go ahead and use the manual white balance. So you tell the camera, hey, this is white, and then you shoot your image. Now, keep in mind that that's going to change even with just a couple feet of depth. And so if you tell it at uh, 20 feet, this is white, and then you go down to 22 feet, you have to tell it what's white again, because otherwise it's going to be off a little bit. So much easier to take your light with you, but much more expensive as well. The ability to fire the strobes via a sync cord. Sync cord is an instant firing of the strobes, um, which makes it really nice. Some of the fiber ones, you'll have misfires. Fiber strobe cables, there'll be misfires. Um, and a, what a fiber does, fiber cable, is it actually uh, takes the light. So you put a little sensor in front of your built-in strobe on your camera, and then it takes that light, transfers it through a fiber cable. The strobe actually senses that light and then fires. And they work fine, but there are misfires quite often. And uh, even if you just kink that cord just a tad bit, it can really screw it, screw it up and not work. And so the, um, the sync cords, they're all electrical connections, and it makes it uh, work all the time, which is really nice. The uh, DSLRs have good autofocus focus capability, so you can really fine-tune your focus. That's really important for macro mode, so you would want to focus on the exact thing you want to be in focus, and then the rest of it can be out of focus which is uh, what we call bokeh in water, and that's a really nice feature to have to really sharpen up and make a, a really interesting image. Um, and then if you're looking for, if you're gonna be looking for a camera, make sure that it has easy to adjust aperture and shutter speeds underwater. Oops, that's not what I wanted. So choices, you have waterproof cameras with no housing that are 10 feet for snorkeling only or 33 to 40 feet for snorkeling and shallow dives like free diving. There are some of those out there on the market you can just buy just ready to go like that. Um, the GoPros now actually for the last two or three versions come ready to go to 30 feet um, without any kind of housing. Now I don't know that I would trust that. It's an expensive camera to take down so I would always put a housing on it. We're talking about diving so most of us are going to get the housing anyway because we're going to go deeper than 30 or 40 feet. And so I would just put the housing on it, even if you only plan to snorkel with it, just because it's an extra step of safety of keeping your camera from getting uh, flooded. 
housing for DSLRs. Um, a lot of times those housings that you get for a large um, digital SLR camera are going to actually be more expensive than the camera body itself, which is kind of crazy, but it is. That's the way that it works. And so um, you're going to be putting a lot of money into it. And, you know, you don't want to go off and buy one of these on a whim and then only dive it once or twice a year. You want to actually dive it and, and use those images for whatever purpose you're going to use them for. Um, and then most of them will have full control of the camera, but some of them only have partial, so they won't have, uh, you won't be able to control every aspect of the camera functions underwater, but most of them are. Um, and then you have the kits, and kits would be like the Sea Life cameras that comes with, some of them come with strobes, some of them come with video lights, and uh, it's ready to go for under the water. So here's a couple little um, options. I'm not going to talk through all of them, but... As you can see on here, this one, the, Lu the um, Lumix, that's ready to go to 40 feet. It's actually a pretty popular camera for uh, snorkeling, and it does okay. Um, and then here's, that's a $284 camera, and that's ready to go. There's no housing you have to buy or anything like that. And then you look down here at the Aquatech Sports housing for a Nikon DSLR that's without the camera is $1,900. So it's just the housing is $1,900. So... Um, another reason that a compact might be a little bit better option for you. Um, here's a Nikon, um, I'm sorry, Eichlite housing for Nik Nikon Coolpix. So this would be like a medium. That's kind of where I started. It was something like that. I actually had a Canon G9 and a Canon housing. Um, so that's a, more of a point and shoot camera, not a DSLR. Had a few options close to the DSLR, but not quite as much. And then the housing itself was only um, $260 for that one. And this one, just the housing, um, gives you a lot more options as far as ports and lenses go. Options to be able to adjust the camera settings from the outside. It's also rated for a little bit deeper um, to $3,100. So you can see there's a very large range of price ranges as far as getting uh, into the underwater photography. And we could talk about, um, here's, a, here's the kits that I talked about. So some of them will come with the strobe and the arm here. Um, this one has dual arms. That's a DSLR package right there. Um, and then some of them will come with two strobes. It really just depends on what you're looking at. But you can see the ranges of the prices here. That's like a beginner's level one. And then um, the one down here would be more of a pro level camera setup. So underwater photography is really all about lighting. Um, we talked about water absorbs light. So it, the light levels drop at lower depths, red is absorbed faster than blue, and causes loss of color, especially at deeper depths. Um, it sucks the contrast and sharpness out. So if you think about water in between you, there it, it's a physical thing, right? In between you and the image versus air, it's just, there's nothing there. It's not dense at all. Air is not dense, whereas water is very dense. And if there's any particulate at all in between you and your subject underwater, it's going to um, cut into the sharpness of the image because it's just the way it works. And so having uh, light with you is really, really uh, important and it makes a huge difference. Um, and I'm gonna show you that in some images I have here. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, four sources for light. You have strobes, dive lights, focus lights, and then the sun. Sun will be called uh, ambient light shooting and that's really uh, just fine for shallow water photography. So I'd say 15, 20 feet at the max. You can get some really decent images by just using the sunlight. Keeping in mind that if you, uh, you know, that's the only option you have and your whole week is a, a cloudy week at your destination for diving, you're just not going to get, you know, what you want out of it because you don't have some direct sunlight. And that can happen in some of the places. You know, Bonaire has a rainy season where they'll have clouds for, you know, a month straight, and it's not necessarily just really bad clouds, but even uh, changing clouds. So you have a, a cloud roll through and cover up the light for a half hour, and then it's light again. Well, that's half hour of your dive that you don't have the light you want. So ambient light is not necessarily a bad thing, but sometimes it can be um, a pain. It can reduce how much productivity you can have if you don't have that direct sunlight. Focus lights. Focus lights are used to help you focus underwater. So it's a light that's going to let the camera actually see the image you're trying to shoot and be able to focus on the image because focus is based on uh, the sensor doing some work in the background, but it has to be able to see what's going on in front of it to do that work to focus. 
Um, and then dive lights, we could use a dive light. So holding a dive light out in front of you to illuminate the subject you're trying to shoot, you could do that. Um, it adds a whole new complexity because you're now trying to hold a camera and a dive light on the subject. Also, most of the dive lights that people carry, they're very um, narrow beams. And so you're going to have a very hot spot in your image, whereas the edges will end up being um, dark and then the middle will be hot. So a video light is actually probably a better option for that where you have a more even spread of the light. And then strobes, which is probably the preferred strobes, will, um, when you fire the uh, camera, will illuminate the whole scene for you. And um, a lot of them will have through the lens, which means that they're actually going to see, it fires, it happens so fast you can't even tell, but it fires a pre-flash or pre-strobe, it focuses really quick adjust the amount of strobe that it needs for the final picture and then it fires the final picture it happens all within one little you don't even have to do anything it's like just a single shot but if you watch a video and um if you go into our roatan shark dive for last year or the year before you can see what i'm talking about when um, i'm shooting with my strobes it looks like every time i shoot it's firing twice it's i mean it's real fast bam bam and then but i was only shooting once and so that's a neat little feature uh, light quality underwater, the amount of light is a big thing. The color of the light is a big thing. Direction of the light is huge. And amount of diffusion or softness. So this, you, what you want is you want a lot of light because the, you can always slow down, or I'm sorry, speed up your shutter speed to make it capture the light faster. But anytime you slow down your shutter speed, you take the, um, the risk of having motion in your image. Color of the light is important because we want it to be as natural as we can. We want it to be as close to real as we can. Some of that can be done in post-processing, but um, if you can take a light that has more natural of a color, and when I say color, if you look at the sun, if you take the sun and take the sunlight and then uh, compare that to like a really uh, white LED, it's a different color and it's going to make the image come out differently than it would be if it were just in the sun, whereas the sun would be our baseline for that. Direction of the light makes a huge difference underwater, especially with strobes, if you have particulate in the water. So we call it backscatter. If your lens is looking straight ahead and your strobe is looking straight ahead and a fire, the light will hit anything, any particulate that's in the water and bounce off of that particulate and come straight back to your lens. And so you're going to get you're going to see those speckles, we call it back, backscatter, which is really just a reflection of light on the particulate in the water. And so what we like to do with the strobes is we'll move them to the side and have the light actually go at an angle towards what we're shooting. And that way, when it reflects off particulate, it goes back at that same angle, but not into our lens, if that makes sense. So um, another little kind of tip or trick, if you will, for trying to keep that backscatter, what we call backscatter or, or noise in our images out. And then uh, diffusion and softness, that's another thing. With a video light, you have a very soft light coming out. You don't have that harsh pointed light like I talked about with the dive light. And Or you can put a diffuser on, which will make it more of a, a soft light on a strobe. Um, I've already talked about a lot of this. If you want to look at the actual depths uh, red starts going away at 15 feet that's why i said if you're going to do ambient light shooting you want to be no deeper than 20 feet 15 20 feet 10 15 feet is probably the ideal uh, after you get down 25 feet you lose orange uh, yellow starts going away at 35 40 feet and then green at 70 75 feet so the deeper you go the bluer your image is going to get with just the blues the blues are the last thing to go uh, loss of color underwater, I already talked about that a little bit. So horizontal distance counts, not just the vertical distance. So strobes can light a subject up to five feet away. Light travels a total of 10 feet. Um, five there and five back, significant loss of reds once you start getting into those uh, distances. So you got to be close. You got to get as close as you can. Closer is better. That's why that fisheye lens, that really, really wide lens, and you can get really close and still have the full image in there is important. Our brain compensates for color loss to a point. And so when you're underwater, you your brain is still seeing some of the colors, um, but the camera lens doesn't adjust like our brains do. And so it's important to note that. And that's another reason that a lot of people will carry light with them on just a regular dive, with, even without a camera, because they want to see the true colors. You can kind of just point it down and it'll be able to bring out those colors. 
So here's what I'm talking about with um, telling it the white balance. So you get to tell the camera what the what the white is and how you're losing your reds. So the image on the left here is shot without any any kind of processing whatsoever. And you can see it's kind of bland. So it's blue, there's not much color in it. And you go over here, and this is all done post-processing. Um, or this could be an image that you got if you were to tell the camera what was white underwater. Um, but this was done post-processing. And so we, what we did is we went in and we told the software, hey, you know, this is what white is supposed to be. So in this case, I probably would have picked something on the sand here because the sand is generally pretty white. And the camera says, oh, okay, well, that's what white is supposed to do. We're going to take some of the blues out. We're going to put some reds in. And you end up with an image on the right here, which is much more realistic to what was going on. I'm going to show you in a second how to do that in Lightroom. And there's a bunch of different software that you can use to do that. So don't think Lightroom is the only thing. Here's another one where the very kind of bland image on the left, not much detail. And then with some post-processing, we've brought out the reds, brought out the colors. The blue actually on the right one here looks a little bit better because it, you have the contrast. And we've also done some uh, editing with the, the uh, light um, or the exposure on that one. So reflected light underwater, light penetrates deeper on the surface conditions. Um, penetrates depends on the surface condition. So choppy water reflects more light instead of letting it come down. Sunlight from the horizon reflects more sunlight than above. Uh, brightest conditions are 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on a sunny day. So that's if you're looking to do some ambient light shooting, that would be a good time to do ambient light shooting. Um, and then you end up with some different quality images for morning or late afternoon where you have the sun's more further down on the horizon and it gives you just a, a softer uh, light. So most top side photographers will choose to shoot in the morning or the evening because you get the shadows and you're able to get some depth with your images versus a straight down light. So you're just gonna have a very flat image. Um, with the uh, underwater, you, if you're looking for the truer colors, you're gonna wanna have to shoot between 10 and two um, because of the brighter conditions. Uh, I talked about backscatter already. So the point of these Let's see these big arms right here on the strobe so this is a camera here you have the arms and the strobes um, what you want to do is you want to point the strobes at an angle so these are facing straight forward right now and so if the light came out here as you shot the image and there was particulate in the water out here it would bounce straight back into the sensor and you would get that particulate in your image we don't want that so we would rotate these so that they're firing this way or even sometimes if they're broad enough firing back out this way you just play with it underwater and you're going to not get that backscatter in there, which is um, one of the biggest complaints for most underwater photographers is that backscatter. I get ahead of myself and talk, talk about this stuff. Um, let's see. One thing you can do, especially if you're shooting like inside of a wreck or anywhere where there's particulate in the water, is to help avoid backscatters is to use a proper uh, kick to keep from stirring up the bottom or stirring up the particulate in the water. That would be a frog kick. Um, perfect buoyancy is always really, really good so that you're not going to be bumping into anything and stirring any of the particulate up in the water. Um, macro, you're only going to shoot from a few inches. So if you think about the less water you have between your camera and the image you're shooting, the less chance of particulate being in between there or the less particulate that will be in between there. And so a uh, macro, we want to be really, really close. Um, don't shoot against open water. Use the reef. You always want to have some sort of reference and so an image where you have let me see here let me show you this image for instance we have the diver there's the reef slash sand on the bottom and there is open ocean behind her but if you were to take the same image and take this whole bottom part out so the reef and the sand take that out and just make it blue like this water here there's no reference. It would be a very bland image. So that's what we mean by uh, saying that you don't want to use uh, open water as the background. There are times where something like that might be interesting. So for instance, if you had a whale shark in the open ocean and you had a couple divers uh, over top or in between you and the whale shark, you could get some depth by having those divers there, some, um, some reference as far as size and stuff goes. But most of the time, you don't want to just shoot in the open water the images is not going to be appealing uh, and you can always edit in Photoshop if that happens 
I'm gonna show you. Here's a here's a good example of backscatter. Um, see the little dots here on the image. All these little dots. That is a reflection from the strobe coming back to the camera because the strobe was uh, oriented straight ahead. In this image, the strobes were aimed to the sides. You can see actually a little bit of a hot spot over here, which means it was aimed over there. And because it was the strobes were angled out, the backscatter did not get reflected back into the image. So that's what we mean by backscatter and adjusting your light. This is another example of an open water shoot um, where open water is the background. You just have, there's really, it's not a very appealing, it's a couple fish, right? So it's not super appealing. Now, if you had a wreck in the background or even a diver in the background on this, you would have some sort of composition for it, but this is kind of a very bland image. A little bit better here. And so we have some uh, reference. So you have the reef up front here. This parrotfish is eating some reef. And then you have the sand in the background. So this one's a little bit better, gives you some better uh, area to look at and more of a reference, kind of makes you flow through the image a little bit. Um, here's another one where you have some reference, which is pretty cool. Um, what I tend to try to do is to avoid shooting straight down like this because it's really, you don't have a lot of depth in this image. So you can see the, some of the reef because we're divers, we know how this is, but if you're really aiming to take images that non-divers are gonna be able to grab a hold of and figure out, um, and divers of course, but if you can get the non-divers to figure out what's going on, absolutely your divers will be able to. So this is a this is not a bad image, but this uh, spotted eagle ray is coming down and you can see um, the depth because of the, the background. Now, if you were to come down at an angle say a little bit lower and have some open ocean in the background along with the bottom of the, the ocean here, that would be a pretty cool image. Another one where you, this one actually has some fairly good depth in it because you have something in the background. You have the reef in the background here and just a ton of fish. That one's not necessarily something I would like hang on a wall, but it's a pretty cool image because there's just a ton of fish there. Gives you some depth of reefs in the background. Here's another one where you have really good colors. So this was taken with a strobe and you can see a lot of different uh, colors in here and a ton of life. I mean, I could pick out a couple things in here. There's a fish there, I'm not sure what that is. There's a shrimp in there. Might be hard to see on the live, but a bunch of stuff. Again, not a lot of depth though. So this is kind of a very flat image. If you were to come, let's say that this was being shot from above. If you were to come lower, and have a little bit of open water in the back, you would have, it would be a much more appealing image. This one's not too bad, it's a little grainy. Uh, this is probably taken with a lower end camera. And because there's not a lot of light down there, it had to take a, a faster, I'm sorry, slower shutter speed. And there's a little bit of blur going on here, but you have some depth. So you have the open ocean in the back here, that gives it depth. And then you have the sand, the reef, and the fish, of course. So these are some images I took. Those were all examples I had before that I pulled just off of the internet. Um, here's some examples that I took. So as I described just a second ago, having that ocean in the background gives you that depth. That image really shows you, it gives a lot of information to where, okay, the top of the surface of the water is up here. Here's a piece of reef, a piece of coral head, and you can see the light is really well done. Um, so the light has illuminated the reef here in front of me. Obviously the light's not gonna go all the way up to the surface and come back down at the same amount of time it takes to reach this and back to your lens. So you've illuminated the reef portion here, the brain coral, and then not the surface, which is nice. This is actually one of my favorite images. One of the reasons I tell people to spend as much time as you can based on your gas consumption at that hang line. If your safety stop is done and you have extra gas in your tank, just hang out there because you can see some really cool stuff. So this one was taken um, in North Carolina uh, above the U-352, which is one of the more popular uh, Russian, I'm sorry, German subs that was sunk um, out there. And I was done my safety stop. Uh, I probably had like seven or 800 PSI left in my tank. So I was gonna run it down to 500 and then come up had my big camera with me and uh, the diver back here was on the hang line. There wasn't much current. So I was kind of drifting off and just staying at a decent uh, depth just to hanging out. 
and there were these barracudas swimming underneath the boat and this one started to come up to me and so I put my camera out in front of me and I just waited and waited and waited and he literally bumped his nose bumped the uh, the camera lens port so um, I got this image I was really happy with it the reason I bring this up is because even though it is open ocean in the background you have a diver back here which gives it that depth we were talking about so it gives it some um, some value as to, to what's going on if you take the diver out and just had that blue background it might still be an okay image but um, the diver really gives it that that neat aspect in the background on that one these are all uh, wide angle shots so these were all taken with a fisheye lens so even though this piece of reef here looks like I'm probably six or eight feet away I was probably only one or two feet from it because the wide angle of the fisheye lens is such a wide image, you can get really, really close and get the entire thing that you want to shoot in there. So again, we have the depth back here. We have the bottom of the ocean. I don't know why I didn't rotate this the other way. So that's the bottom. Of the, or this might be on a wreck. I think this is on a wreck. So this might be the wreck. I don't remember. Um, it probably needs to be rotated. Uh, but you can see the colors, the reds are all brought out by the strobes. You have the detail on the surface of the water, the ripples of the water. It adds a lot of content to the image. Another one with wide angle. So this was done in Bonaire. This is a little wreck that's down at, I don't know, probably 80, 90 feet. Um, open ocean in the background. But what gives this depth is this little box back here. The sand and the fish. Again, I was only one or two feet from this when I shot it, and because I was that close, the strobes were able to illuminate the color that you would not normally see. Normally, this would all be blue if you took, shot it without strobes. This was shot with ambient light, so as you can see from the top here, this is also in Bonaire, from the top portion of the photo here, you can see the ripples are pretty close. So I wasn't, but this I think is eight feet of water. So this is a good example where ambient light would be more than sufficient for an image uh, versus having to take strobes along. Even though I did have my strobes on the camera when I took this image, I was not using them. I had actually turned them off because the ambient light was more than enough uh, for the, what I was shooting. And so the turtle here, if you were at 20 or 30 feet, the turtle would be all blue. But he's got all his browns and colors in here because I was only 8 feet, 8 or 9 feet deep and the light was still keeping the reds in there. So um, another example here. Also, if you were to think about if this image didn't have the sand in here and was just blue, it would be fairly bland. It would be a blah image. But you have reference here. So it gives you that depth that we're looking for. You can see, okay, well, there's the sand. So it you can see for a good little distance, so it naturally guides your eye out there and then back. So that's the kind of stuff we're looking for with the photography. Another image underwater on a reef, I think it's probably a Bonaire as well. Um, and what gives this depth is the sun up here, the rays coming down through here. There's actually bubbles back here from divers. So you can see the bubbles coming up. And then uh, the light here, I actually had brought the strobe down from the bottom and aimed it up and so it gave it some depth using it that way oops macro is actually one of my favorite ways to shoot fisheye is you're going to get those dramatic images like i just had but macro is really cool because you can get some really neat stuff um, this is a yellow-headed jawfish and this was also in bonaire these guys are probably the size of if you think about a regular size sharpie um, that would be a large one, a large um, jaw, uh, jawfish. And so these guys, they dig little holes down into the sand, and that's where they reside. And then as they feed, what they'll do is they'll come out of the hole, and they actually come out of the hole, you know, six, eight, ten inches sometimes, and sit there and pick the stuff that they're eating out of the water as it passes by them. Well, when you get close to them, they retreat back into their hole for safety. And so um, this image was taken probably over the time frame of about 20 30 minutes is spent for me to have to I settled down on the sand in front of him and waited till he came up kind of he got used to me being there so he come out of the hole I go a little bit closer a little bit closer this is a macro image so I was only probably six or eight inches away from him when I got this 
but I slowly inched my way closer to him, letting him know that I was not a threat. And then finally he came up enough for me to grab an image like this. This was also taken with some strobes. As you can see, the lighting's really good here. And then um, you can see the blue in the eyes, which is really a really cool thing about them. One little note about these guys, if you ever run into them, they're hard to spot, but if you spot them, there's gonna be some more in the same area. And what you, um, you've probably seen an image or two of this, but they keep there, the male will actually hold the eggs in his mouth and protect them until they hatch. And if you can get these guys with their mouth open and a jaw full of eggs, um, just phenomenal images. So I've seen them in a bunch of magazines. You might have seen them there. There's another one of the same little guy. So I had just, um, I don't think I adjusted my position. I think he just moved over. Um, but you can see that when you get macro, the detail gets really, really cool. So you can see actually the lens of his eye there. I love shooting these guys. They're a lot of fun. Uh, here's a goby. These guys are about the size of a pencil eraser. And they're also skittish. And he actually is in a hole here on this coral. And so he'll go back in there. And they do a very similar thing where they'll pop out and kind of eat the stuff out of the water. Um, and getting close to them is really tough as well. So when I'm doing macro, a lot of times I'll take a dive and just spend an entire dive on a single coral head. Uh, trying because if you find a coral head there is a ton of life there and a lot of people swim over it They never even see the little stuff, but if you slow down enough to actually look um, There is a ton of this little stuff. Um, so the gobies are really cool. Those guys are, are really neat um, This is a Christmas tree worm. These guys can come in a ton of different colors uh, shapes and sizes um, They're really absolutely gorgeous things to shoot again. This is macro uh, something to note on this, it looks like I shot this on a night dive, but I didn't. To get this effect with the black in the background here, what you need to do is you need to have a very, very, very fast shutter speed. So what happens is you're not capturing any of the ambient light in the background. You're just capturing as fast as you can get and still have the strobes illuminate the front here. So I had the strobes fire very very fast shutter speed so i only caught the light from what the strobe was able to illuminate in front of me um, and so there is actually on this image there was actually a coral head behind here and what i did is i had the shutter capture this light as soon as it hit the worms and shut before the light from back here had had a chance to reflect back it's a really neat technique it gives you that nice dark back uh background the black background and people think it's night photography but it's not it actually was in the middle of the day there's another one uh probably one of my favorite christmas tree worm shots this uh hair stuff here is part of the coral i don't even know what it's called uh, but these guys were settled right in between them i thought it gave it a really neat texture of the image as you can see the blur back here that's when we talk about aperture that's what this is back here so we have the depth of field is really good on this you have a nice focused image in the front here and the back is blurred out and naturally tends to draw your eyes to the part that you want focused, which is in the front there. Another Christmas tree worm macro, super macro. Um, something to note with these guys is they are live. And so they actually, when they detect a change in the light or the water, um, and once you get close to them, they will actually pop back in and turn into nothing. And then they'll slowly kind of pull themselves back out. They feed off the water as it passes through these fine hairs here and that's how they eat but um, here's another one this is actually one that I have printed and hung somewhere but you can see the with macro you can really get the detail that you want I mean these, these things are no larger than um, probably a, a dice if you think about if you have a pair of dice that you're using for a card game or something they're not any bigger than those a pair a, a single dice or die I guess you would call it um, and so they're very small, but having macro lets you get in there and get those images really, really close up, uh, focus really close. That's a bumblebee shrimp. These guys are mm, size of a large fly, so they're not really big either. And they reside in the anemones. So you see the anemone back here, which gives it a really cool background. It kind of gives you some places for your eyes to flow around and look at. Um, they're not necessarily too shy, but they're not going to come right up to you either. So this is where sitting on a single coral head for a full dive gives you the advantage of them getting used to you, you being able to kind of move yourself around to where you can see the good stuff. And then just nice and slow and um, 
you know, nice slow movements is going to keep them from shying away and they'll come out and hang out and take pictures, but done with strobes and a macro lens. So, um, I wanted to talk about some of the technical deep challenges with photography. So all of those images I just took were all under probably 20 or 30 feet. When you start getting into taking images deeper, so for instance, a deep wreck, um, you have less time for shooting, more equipment because you have to carry more gas, whether it's decompression tanks or just more gas for your bottom time. Um, the cost of the equipment can become more expensive um, for depth rating for your housings, for your cameras. Safety is always the priority, so the dive has to come first and the camera stuff will come later, so your photography comes afterwards. You must be very, very, very proficient with diving and proficient with deeper dives and decompression dives before you start putting any of your concentration onto photography because it can become a safety issue. Uh, lighting, the deeper you go, the less light. So as you go deeper, the less ambient light gets down there. You get deep enough, Some, I mean, at 300 feet in Bonaire, there's barely any light at all. Even though it's a bright sunny day and it's normally super bright, it was very dark down at 300 feet. And so you have to bring light with you. Otherwise, you're just not going to get an image if you want it. Um, site access, a lot of times, just depends on where you're at. You may or may not be able to get to those deeper sites. And then obviously training requirements. So those are some challenges of, of deeper diving with photography. Uh, I always touch on this because the rebreather really changed how I started diving with my photography. You have longer bottom times, so your um, your gas consumption. I'm not going to say it's not a concern, but because it always is a concern. But it, you go from you know an average of a 45 minute dive on open circuit to now you can stay down for four hours on the rebreather and not have to worry about you know anything um, with limits. So there are some limits in there. Um, it's not a free for all, but no bubbles to scare the natives and that's a big one. So underwater, fish see fast as being a predator. Anything that's moving fast is usually trying to eat you as far as the fish goes. And so bubbles are fast. When we exhale, they come out of our, our um, regulators fast and they go to the surface fast. Um, and they're also loud. So when if you think about a fish on a reef by itself with no divers around, there's very little noise. I mean, the reef always has noise, but um, it's not a lot of noise. And so and on a normal day for a fish, there's no bubbles, nothing fast, just kind of swimming around and no noise. Well, with the rebreather, that's basically what you are. You become one of them underwater because there are no bubbles. There's no noise. You're becoming a fish. You're just another fish in the sea. And so that gives you a lot better option as far as getting close to stuff, having it not swim away, have it not be spooked. It uh, really changes uh, your photography underwater. Less decompression requirements. Um, that's a big one for the deeper diving because the rebreather is really uh, just a beast when it comes to keeping your decompression as less, least as you have to um, versus uh, just a fixed gas like you would with uh, open circuit scuba. Uh, cost efficient for deep dives versus regular scuba that comes into play with helium. So if you're doing a dead dive below, you know, 150, 160 feet, uh, narcosis always starts to play. You might say you don't feel it, but everybody is be affected by it in one way or the other. Um, and I'd be happy to put you in a deep class and take you down and show you exactly what I'm talking about because not a single person yet have I seen that hasn't been affected in one way or the other with narcosis. But with the rebreather, you can put a little bit of helium in your mix and have a super clear mind throughout the dive versus uh, open circuit. When you start adding helium into your gas mix, it's extremely expensive. Um, you're talking about hundreds of dollars for a single set of tanks filled with helium for an open circuit uh, regular scuba dive versus a rebreather that would be $30 or $40 and you could get two or three dives out of that. So just something else to keep in mind. Disadvantages of the rebreathers is the equipment is intensive, uh, cost is always expensive, it's training intensive, um, support while traveling can be an issue. So for instance, down in Honduras, there's not a lot of support for rebreathers. And so taking a rebreather down there doesn't make a ton of sense if you don't have the support to be able to dive it. Uh, task loading can be intense. Um, rebreathers just by nature are a little bit more task loading. And so you add that onto the photography 
and it definitely can be an issue. And then buoyancy, because you can't fine tune with the rebreather, you cannot fine tune your buoyancy with your breathing like you can on open circuit. Um, buoyancy with photography particularly can be a little bit challenging. So there's, uh, this is some pictures that I took on my rebreather uh, at, on some deep dives. This is actually the wreck of the Windjammer in Bonaire. Um, I'm at probably 180, 190 feet there. Um, and those are two rebreather divers. Actually, that's uh, Lamar Hires from Dive Right. Um, he's down there. We were down shooting some stuff. But what I wanted to point out with this is that I was able to take an image. I was able to focus on taking an image because I had the rebreather. I had a clear mind with the helium. And I was able to... Um, you know, manipulate the controls to take this image. So you have open water in the background. Look how dark everything is that's not in, not lit up by the strobes. That's what I mean by the deeper you get, you lose a lot of that light. So it's really dark down there without any light added in. The reason the divers are lit is because I had strobes and I was really close. This is a fisheye shot. So I was probably only two or three feet from these two divers when I took that image. But because it was fisheye and wide, you were able to get the full image in there. And this has depth because you have the, the actual wreck in the background here. You have the eye hooks that were on the, the railing. Here's the mast. It was a three-masted wooden schooner that sank a long time ago in Bonaire. So this gives you a little bit of depth with the rebreather. This is another one of the same wreck. That's the crow's nest on one of the masts from the wreck. I made this black and white because I thought it made it look make it look uh, mysterious. I am at 200 feet there. Um, and... That's part of the wreck back there. The reef actually sits behind the wreck, so we did not get to see the reef on this one, which is a good thing because the reef would have taken away from the wreck. But you have the crow's nest and the mast coming out. Um, I thought that was a really cool one. Here's another one on the same wreck with color. So you have the wreck in the background. This is, again, at 200 feet. And then I've illuminated the crow's nest portion here in front of me along with part of the diver here. And so that adds a lot of color into it. Here's another one, same wreck. Uh, this is Lamar coming, uh, I'm sorry, not Lamar, Jared coming out of the wreck. And so he had just been inside. Now, if you look, if I would have taken a, a straight down shot on this, I'd have been above him and it would have been a kind of bland picture. But because I got low and I was looking back up, I was able to illuminate the diver part of the wreck here. And you have the open ocean in the background giving it that depth we talked about. Uh, this is another one on the same wreck. So this is uh, it's probably 130, 140 feet. And see how large the wreck is. So it kind of flows out into the unknown there. You have the reef in the background. And the reference here is the divers. Look how small the divers are in comparison to how big the wreck is here. So that gives it a lot of um, reference for that shot. Here's inside the, uh, late, uh, the Hilma Hooker in Bonaire. Um, so we were actually inside. What made this um, shot available was that both of us were on a rebreather. So Ryan here was in there. We were poking around looking at stuff and we found a good spot to set up and found some ref some really cool reference material for the image. So the porthole here made it interesting. And then there's the engine room in the background. Um, and then we were able to capture that image there. Here's another one. Let me show you some... So this is also in the Hilma Hooker. This is in the engine room. What makes this interesting, and we're getting into a little advanced stuff here, is that I have the strobes on the cameras, which is illuminating him in the foreground here on the engine. And if you look over here, that is an off, what we call it, off-camera strobe. Now, what this can really do is give you some really neat um, depth of field and depth into the image. And that's actually a strobe that I had placed over there. We had planned out this dive. This is where being on a rebreather really makes it nice uh, because you can spend a couple hours down there shooting, which involves, you know, a half hour, 45 minutes of setting up the, the shot. So you find a shot where you want to shoot. You put out the uh, off-camera strobes. You do a couple test shots, and then you start bringing the models in for the, for the actual shoot. Um, this is actually a strobe back here that did not fire. I probably should have Photoshopped that out, but that was supposed to be an off-camera one firing as well. This one did fire over here. You don't see the strobe because it's actually off the image, but um, these have what a cord coming out of them, and we put them somewhere within the front area of the image here so that it's going to catch the light from my strobes on my camera, 
the sensor catches the light and then fires these strobes at the same time. And what that does is it illuminates the background and gives that image some really good depth. So you can see further back. Here is, I did not take this image. My friend Dan Wright took this image of me. That's me um, and that's Tracy in one of the caves in Florida, Jenny Springs in the gallery. Just for reference, this area, you could probably drive three or four tractor trailers through. So it's a very large, large area to light up. This shot, I think, involved 12 or 13 off-camera strobes. And so they're all positioned back here. You can see one's right here. There's a couple back here, a couple down here. There might even be one or two up here to get the full image. So if you shot this without those off-camera strobes, you wouldn't even be able to see the divers. You would just see this forefront piece here of limestone and then you wouldn't be able to see any of the rest of it. So there's off-camera strobes. These are some pretty advanced shooting techniques, but um, just some stuff you can do underwater. Um, so before we go to that, I want to go and show you guys real quick this image. So actually, even before that, let me show you something else. So I have, this has kind of been I talked earlier about how I've kind of moved from my digital SLR to carrying my GoPro a little bit more often and this is exactly why. So not only has the technology with the GoPros gotten much better, the sensors are getting better at lower light, um, but the technology with light is getting much better as well. So this is my current setup for GoPro. This is a GoPro Hero 8 uh, black version with an underwater housing. So this is an underwater housing here and I have two um, big blue these are VTL 3800 uh, video lights. They're actually tech lights. So they see in the middle here, this piece right here actually would do a narrow. And then the ones on the outside here do a, a video light. So very wide angle light. I have two of these because that's the best results. The GoPro itself is a very wide angle. So it's going to catch a lot of image and you need to be able to light that image if you want it. So I have two of these. Um, it's obviously small and handheld, so I can literally fold these. What I do is I'll fold these guys in like this before I get in the water. I have a clip here. Uh, Christina Castro, if you're still watching, she knows the uh, little bit of history on this clip. I'll clip this off on something on my BCD, jump in the water. Once I get underwater, I'll go ahead and adjust my lights out. Remember how I talked about straight forward is not always good, so I usually will angle them out like this. And that way you're not getting that backscatter. And the video lights, they stay on all the time. So you can use it for video. Or if you're shooting stills, the light's still there. So it'll still work. So I really like this, um, pers this setup myself. I still love my DSLR. And there's nothing that can replace that. But as far as um, feasibility and flexibility and be able to really carry it on travel, that GoPro setup I just showed you is really just the bee's knees. You're looking at the the GoPro itself is um, four maybe five hundred dollars. Those lights are in the five six hundred range per, and then the tray itself. So you're looking at a substantial investment to get something like that. But even if you started with the GoPro itself and did one light, that would be fairly good. You could get some really good images on it. Um, I've just moved over to the two lights because I like the the flexibility I have of moving the shadows around in the image. So back to this image, this image was taken with a GoPro and so I did not have, um, well, I did have the lights on, but the lights were competing with the ambient light from the sun. And so I was too far away. I didn't get the light that I needed on the diver. And as you can see, it is kind of bland. So it's blue, right? There's a lot of blue here. It's not really crisp, it's not really clean, it's not blue. You have a reference. As far as composition goes, I like it, but as far as like the colors and the sharpness, it's just not really there. So um, what we can do is, in this, I'm using Lightroom for this, for the, um, Adobe Lightroom. You can, there's multiple programs. You could do this in Photoshop as you, if you wanted, and there's multiple other ones that are um, cheaper than both of those to, that you can do very similar things with. But what we're going to do is we're going to tell the software here what white is supposed to be on this image. And once it knows what the white point is, it can adjust the rest of the colors to more realistic what they are. Now, this does not replace a strobe. 
a strobe is really going to be your best option for this. So the, the process for this in Lightroom is you want to pick the, um, the, let me go over here and do it here. You want to pick the white balance tool here, which is a white balance selector tool. It's like a little drop dropper here. And you want to go to a place on the image that you know is white. So for instance, I know that the sand is white. In this case, I know this tag right here on the diver is white because when they tagged our gear when we first checked in, it was a white slate piece that they put our names on. And then what it'll do is it'll let you even get further down. So it's going to give you a pixel by pixel review of what you're hovering over and you can pick the whitest spot you have and then click on it. Now see how that changed the entire image. You have more natural colors now. You've brought what it was very close to looking like underwater. The yellows came out in her octopus. You have more realistic skin tones here. And then from here you can go and play with other stuff like contrast, shadows, highlights, uh, vibrance. We can really kind of make it a more vibrant image that way. Um, saturation is always a tool that I like to tweak with just a little bit. If you go too much, it obviously is going to mess up the image, but you can bring it out and go just kind of a little bit with some saturation there. And that changed that image now completely. Here is an image where my strobe did what it was supposed to. My light did what it was supposed to. So I didn't have to tell it what was white on this because it had the image, the the light was already there and it was proper. The image was proper with the light that I provided. As you can see, the yellows are here. You have the blue in the background because we did not have enough light to illuminate the background. You can even see on this that the light was able to illuminate her hand right here and not this hand. And that's only a matter of, you know, maybe a foot or two in between. So distance really makes a difference when it comes to the light. But as you can see, this is a much more appealing image because it's got some color, some color that was brought out by the strobe that fired on this one. And you have the, the wreck in the background for some reference, some bubbles back there and stuff. So that makes it really nice. Where was I at on this? Okay, so the first step, if you're not a scuba diver to get certified, um, come to us. We're still doing classes, even with the whole COVID thing going. All of the academic work to get scuba certified is done online, so you don't even have to step foot outside your house to do this. Come out and talk to us. Um, well, not, don't come out and talk to us because we're not going to be there, but call us and talk to us. Email us, you know, IM, DM, all that stuff. Call, Contact us and we can get you signed up for a class. Um, your basic open water shirt is all you need to get started with underwater photography. So you would get basic open water certified and you can go right into a photography class. You can go out and start shooting your stuff on your own dives. Learning it yourself or take a class is probably the best way to do it. Um, 10 to 70 year, old, year olds are welcome. Um, we've even done a couple older than 70 year olds. 10 is the lower uh, limit for uh, open water certification, the junior open water certification. So anything less than that, you can't get certified. But at 10, you can get certified. So if you're 10 and you like some photography and you want to do it underwater, come talk to us. And I'm not. Here's some information to contact us. Uh, there's a phone number. We're a full five-star dive center. Uh, either of these ways of contacting us is actually somdivers.com uh, now, so we don't have to spell this whole thing out. Um, SOMD Divers, or you can spell it out. We have both of the domain, so that'll work. And the same thing with this. It would be info at somdivers.com. Um, call us. Email us. Shoot us an instant message on Facebook, whatever you want to do. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to get you into some underwater photography. We sell all kinds of equipment to be able to do that. We carry Icolite. I can't, I don't carry Canon or Nikon, so I wouldn't be able to get you set up with a DSLR as far as the lenses and the camera goes, but most of the time when people come to us, they already have that picked out or they've already bought it. Uh, but I can get you into one of the quality Icolite housings. I can get you into... Um, a Sea Life camera, which are, are fairly nice. Um, the GoPro stuff, we carry the full line of GoPro stuff, the underwear housing, the lights for that. Absolutely get you set up with all that. Uh, before I leave, I think I still, it's not showing me how many people I have going here, but 
Uh, is anybody still here? If you are, please I'm comment. Up on my phone real quick. Let me see. Can I see? It's showing three people still there. Does anybody have any questions? This is the time to pick my brain because I can't be doing anything else. It's driving me nuts. But, hey John, good to see you buddy. John is one of my protégés with underwater photography and I've actually been really impressed by, by him over the last couple years that he's been doing some stuff. Speaking of which, um, those images that I showed you guys, so the, that one was shot with a camera that John, uh, lost in the middle of the ocean somewhere. Just a interesting little fact. I'm sure you don't want to relive that account, John, but, um, yeah, so I had moved up, I had upgraded my camera system and, um, John got my old one and he lost it so short drive anybody else questions you gotta have some questions there's always a ton of the questions when it comes to the photography stuff nobody two people left all right well it's probably time to roll out Hopefully you got something out of this this is one of those things that I could talk about literally for four hours straight um, We'll do, the club is scheduled to have me in to do this presentation in May. Um, so if uh, things are back rolling, hopefully by then, and I can get in and do this presentation in um, May, I will have this full presentation where I'll be able to expand on some stuff and I'll have a bunch of gear for you to put hands on and check out and I'll be able to do a little bit better um, presentation as far as showing you the guys the actual gear itself what it looks like and how it functions which is a, a much better way to do it but um so keep an eye out on the club's website for that and then um hopefully I'll, I'll see you guys there so everybody stay safe please continue doing the social distancing thing this thing's getting to be um for those of you that don't know i'm a paramedic and it's getting concerning so um my real job i, I do the paramedic thing 48 hours a week and um, you know, we're suiting up on calls and stuff like that. So it's getting a little bit scary and we're not even in the thick of it yet. It's getting ready to kick off here within the next week or two. So everybody stay safe, stay home. If you don't have to go out, please just stay home. I mean, really, I know it's sometimes you itch to get out, but just stay home, you know, walk around the neighborhood, you know, stay six feet away from everybody. Um, but just stay home, watch our videos. Our YouTube channel has a bunch of these product review videos that I've done. Um, you can do that. If you do want to shop for something, um, please, we could use the business. It's obviously, it's hurting a lot of small businesses, but, uh, we haven't, we haven't had a couple, good couple of weeks, three weeks now. And, uh, you know, we're going to do everything we can to keep it going. But, um, anything you can, if you're looking in the shop and something, con contact us, we can ship it. Um, we'll make sure you're taken care of and everybody stay safe. So. All right, we will see you on the next one, which I believe today is, what's today, Wednesday. So, is today Wednesday? Yes, today's Wednesday. So the next one should be Friday. I'm actually on shift on Friday, so I'm going to probably try to twist John's arm and get him to do something for you guys. He's much more entertaining when it comes to this stuff. So look forward for uh, Dive Master John on Friday to do something at some point. So. All right, guys, uh, have a good one, stay safe, and we will see you on the next one.